In 2014, Maria Cahill told Spotlight how the IRA forced her as a teenager to meet the man she said had raped her and then told her to keep silent. My mum came up and asked me, right, right, what's wrong, Maria? Has anybody touched you? And I had been told by the IRA that I wasn't allowed to tell anybody. I couldn't even go to my own parents and say, this is what's happened. Keep it, keep it quiet there, folks. This is Maria Cahill at 16 years old. Within days of this video, she says she underwent a prolonged cycle of sexual abuse, including rape by a member of the IRA. This is the man she accuses former Republican prisoner Martin Morris, her uncle by marriage. He strenuously denied the allegations and in 2014 he was acquitted in court when Maria Cahill withdrew her evidence against him. No one apart from Maria Cahill and Martin Morris can be certain of the whole truth about what happened. And they are two people with completely different stories. Tonight, Maria Cahill gives a unique interview to Spotlight about the recent police ombudsman's report in which the police are found to have had intelligence that children were being abused by an IRA man on which they failed to act. Despite being told that the IRA had taken it upon themselves to conduct their own investigation. She tells us how she feels the report vindicates her stand. <laughs> In 2010, Maria Cahill walked into a PSNI station to make a statement about allegations of sexual abuse against an IRA man. It had taken over a decade to do so. August 1997, Maria Cahill, then 16 years old, says she had fallen asleep at her uncle's home in Ballymurphy in West Belfast. I don't even remember going to sleep on the city, but I certainly remember waking up and immediately knew something wasn't right. Um, someone had their hands down my trousers, trying to get the trousers off, and it clicked. You know, Marty Morris is here. He had a distinct smell of a mixture of roll-up cigarettes and links. I knew him by his breathing. And the only thing that I remember then at that point is the thought, you know, please, let this stop. Um, what am I going to do? Once the first rape happened, you feel like a piece of dirt, you don't feel like you're worth anything. Essentially, at 16, I was still a kid. And like that, he, that was it. Uh, the, the whole point of childhood was just completely erased. And you then become something that belongs to him. Not a, I don't even think you become human anymore. Maria Cahill had another element of abuse allegations to report to the PSNI. An IRA investigation into her abuse, culminating in a kangaroo court where she says she came face to face with her alleged abuser. He told me that they were going to read my body language to see who was telling the truth. Maria's consistent account of how she says the IRA treated her over months of their investigation is all the more shocking given her family background. Her great uncle was Joe Cahill, sentenced to hang in the 1940s for the murder of a policeman. He was pardoned and became one of the founders of the provisional IRA. He later became the IRA's chief of staff. Roundabout the middle of 1970, and I saw that as the opportune time to strike out the Brits. 
but to Maria Cahill, he was just Uncle Joe. What kind of relationship did you have with him? Um, really good, actually. We got on very well. It was like a, a grandfather, granddaughter relationship. So for Maria, part of a Republican family, speaking to the PSNI in 2010 had an extra element of difficulty, but she was prepared to put her faith in the police and the public prosecution service. Ultimately, she was failed by both. In 2014, all of the court cases that resulted from her evidence collapsed when Maria Cahill withdrew her evidence. She did so because she believed the authorities' decision to split the abuse and the IRA kangaroo court into separate cases had fatally weakened them both. The police ombudsman's report appears to agree with her that the cases should not have been split. But long before what Maria sees as vindication of her decision in this report, she had decided to collapse the cases and speak out publicly. She told Spotlight about how the IRA dealt with her allegations of abuse, but also what she said were serious failings by those who were supposed to help her. After four years of sitting in the process, Jennifer, I believed that the PPS and the police had seriously um, lost the case before they had even went into the courtroom. It's taken four years for Maria Cahill to learn the details of how the police failed her. All of those agencies, the police, special branch, the IRA, Sinn Féin, um, the Republican community as a whole. Every single one of them have failed children. And there comes a point in time when you get very, very tired of having to say the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and when your confidence gets completely knocked in every organisation as a result. But what was the alternative? Because had I stopped talking about it, we never would have come um, to this point where this Ombudsman's report lays out very clearly exactly what happened. In 2015, the Public Prosecution Service apologised after a review by Sir Keir Starmer into three cases linked to the alleged rape of Maria Cahill. The Starmer report found that Maria Cahill and two other alleged rape victims were let down by the PPS's handling of the cases. The then Director of Public Prosecutions apologised for the failings of his office. One issue I wish to make clear at the very outset is that no blame in relation to the collapse of these cases attaches to Maria Cahill or the other two victims. In Sir Keir's words, the Public Prosecution Service led you down and for that I wish to say sorry. The PSNI is the latest agency in the spotlight. This is the police ombudsman's response to Maria Cahill's complaint about the PSNI's handling of her case. Seen exclusively by Spotlight, it says that its findings support the conclusion that Maria Cahill was failed by police. I'm still trying to digest the enormity of the report. You know, we're a few days in at this point in time, um, just about a week. So I'm still going through it. On reading the report just before her meeting with the police ombudsman, Dr. Michael Maguire, she says one line in particular immediately stood out. I read the first line in relation to the IRA investigation and I, because I know an IRA investigation took place, the enormity of it actually wasn't sinking in, probably until um, we were just heading down towards that meeting with Dr. Maguire. The police ombudsman's letter stated that he had confirmed that OUC Special Branch began to receive reports from 2000 alleging that Mr Morris was involved in the sexual abuse of certain children and that the IRA were investigating the matter. 
This reporting continued for a number of months. That detail is hugely significant because since Maria Cahill went public, the Republican movement have consistently refused to admit that there was an IRA investigation into her abuse allegations. And at the time she says it was taking place, here it states that RUC Special Branch also began to receive reports from 2000 alleging Mr Morris was involved in the sexual abuse of certain children and that the IRA were investigating the matter. And what's more, the reporting continued for a number of months. I mean, even reading that line in itself, it's hard to describe what the reaction was to that, only because it's my life and I know that it happened. A big question arising from this is, what did the police do in the year 2000 with reports suggesting that an IRA man in West Belfast was abusing certain children. The Ombudsman's letter also states that none of the information in relation to Mr Morris was shared outside of OUC Special Branch. And the Police Ombudsman has found no evidence of any police action taken as a result of this information. The enormity of finding out that the agencies had that in the year 2000 um, and could have potentially stopped trauma being caused to me and other children as a result is something which I don't actually think has sunk in yet. I think it's horrendous um, to think that that could happen to anybody. And the people who are supposed to be in a position in relation to policing or, or any agency which is supposed to protect children um, from being abused. The report goes on to say that the police ombudsman has been unable to identify a specific police officer to hold accountable for the failure of police to respond to this intelligence. But it wasn't the only strand of intelligence that a police unit received about Martin Morris. Or you see CID received information in 2000 that suggested Mr Morris was suspended from Sinn Féin, as it was suspected he was abusing certain children. This information was placed on police systems and shared with specific police officers. The police ombudsman also established that Mr Morris was not on the National Criminal Intelligence System and or the Police National Database as a result of the information received in 2000 connecting him with the alleged sexual abuse of children. There's no way of even quantifying the hurt that has been caused and the hurt that has been caused even by seeing that line in it, that people did absolutely nothing in relation to it. And worse still, it meant that when uh, Martin Morris left Belfast or was put out of Belfast or whatever happened to him, those agencies knew that information from the year 2000 um, and did nothing with it. You know, he wasn't entered onto the policing database, he wasn't entered onto the National Intelligence database, and that meant then that if there was ever a reason for anybody to search those databases in the intervening period, that this information in relation to the sexual abuse of children did not come up. The PSNI has admitted that it failed Maria Cahill and two other complainants at the centre of this case. Three officers were disciplined. The Chief Constable met and personally apologised to Maria Cahill. In his statement, George Hamilton said he fully accepts the Ombudsman's report and said that the Ombudsman had noted that the previous intelligence failures would not occur today. But this report, which is focused on the police, actually raises more questions for another organisation, one that Maria Cahill says has yet to take full responsibility for its actions, the Republican movement and specifically Sinn Féin. In 1998, Maria Cahill claims that she disclosed her abuse to her cousin Siobhan O'Hanlon. The convicted bomber was the only IRA member to survive the SAS shooting in Gibraltar. She later became Gerry Adams' assistant and a member of Sinn Féin's talks team. 
Maria Cahill says that over time she told a number of women inside the Republican movement about the abuse. That's when, in 1999, she says her second nightmare began. At that time, you know, in West Belfast, the IRA were the authority figure. I mean, you knew it wasn't good news when somebody came and said, we need to see you later and wouldn't tell you what it was about. So I think the natural reaction for anybody would be to panic. The IRA investigation culminated in a kangaroo court where she says she was brought face to face with Martin Morris. He told me that they were going to read my body language to see who was telling the truth and that they were going to bring him into a room. I immediately panicked um, because the, I mean, the one thing that you don't want to do is come face to face with the guy who has abused you. And it was a massive panic. I heard the door go on, I heard the footsteps coming up into the room. Um, and they then basically allowed Morris for a number of hours to tear strips off me. Over 20 years on, and Maria Cahill is still dealing with the trauma of her experiences. I was hospitalised in 2005 um, because I couldn't cope with what had happened to me in the years 97, 98, 99, 2000. There were times when I absolutely didn't want to be on this planet because I couldn't cope with the trauma that was visited upon me. Um, there were other times when I did make suicide attempts and was hospitalised again. And even from the point after um, when the court cases collapsed, it was a horrible, horrible thing to have to deal with. Then I went into the public domain and that was equally as horrible, let me tell you. And there were times in the intervening period between 2014 and now where I felt that I couldn't go on with it. And I say if I had succeeded in doing that, that's somebody's life that we're talking about. It's my life. If you do want to talk about this, it's okay. But I know from conversations that we've had that you've always felt guilty, even though it wasn't your fault, for anything that happened other children in connection to this issue. In my head, I thought that because I didn't know an awful lot about abuse, I knew nothing about it um, other than what was happening, that I thought that if this abuser was doing this to me, at least he wasn't doing it to other people. And then the IRA came in and, and had their investigation into it and the guilt was swimming with me um, because even though I had told people in 97 and 98, uh, at, there came a point in time when that abuse stopped happening to me. In July 2000 then when um, Siobhan O'Hanlon came actually to get me from a radio station and came up the stairs. Um, to tell me that another child had been abused. It was like somebody beating me around the head with a baseball bat, to be quite honest. And I went and spoke to the child at the time. And it's bad enough, I suppose, that you deal with your own abuse, but to see the hurt on another young person's face, um, in relation to what has happened to them, is horrendous. So I kind of still probably will always have this thing that if I had told someone different, if I hadn't have gone to Siobhan O'Hanlon or those other Sinn Féin women, if I had have gone to someone else who maybe had some modicum of responsibility about them, that it could have stopped um, things happening to other people. And it probably isn't helpful to think like that because actually the responsibility for the hurt that was caused lies with Martin Morris. Um, doesn't lie with me. But that's what abuse does. Um, you blame yourself for it and I think I probably will always have a part of myself that will blame myself for it. Um, not only in relation to me, but in relation to other people. In terms of blame, when the court case collapsed, I know that, that you were 
blamed and you're, you've consistently been blamed for the collapse of that court case. And the Sir Keir Starmer report and this letter shows quite clearly that, Maria, it wasn't your fault. No, um, it wasn't. And it's very clear. I mean, the two independent reports are there, which detail from start to finish the failings in the case. The failure for the collapse of the cases rests with the agencies. Um, and it doesn't rest with me. And it doesn't rest with the other two victims. And it, it also might have been helpful if people actually had have come in and given every scrap of detail that they had and information in relation to Martin Morris. Um, because it would have taken the burden of responsibility off the victims, off the people who actually were abused, to have to try and prove every single thing that had happened to them. Other adults had information in relation to this. Um, there were people who didn't come forward and give statements. There were people who didn't allow themselves to be questioned by the police. And there are people who are still, um, at this day, do not, um, will not admit the de level of detail that they knew in relation to it. As part of the original Spotlight investigation in 2014, we specifically asked Sinn Féin, was Martin Morris a member of the party between 1998 and 2000? The party responded by way of a statement to a series of questions, but we did not receive an answer to that question. And that's the key question that Maria, as she sees it, wants Sinn Féin to be open about. And the question is even more significant because of this information from the Ombudsman's report. RUC CID received information in 2000 that suggested Mr Morris was suspended from Sinn Féin as it was suspected that he was abusing certain children. What was your reaction when you, when you read this in the, in the letter? I was very angry. And I don't think it, it took me maybe a day or two to get my head around that it's one line, uh, you know, out of a 65 page report, but it's a very important line for me, certainly. Um, one, it provides independent um, information from mine that this man was connected with Sinn Féin, never mind the IRA. Um, two, that when I went public in 2014, Sinn Féin screamed from the rooftops, we have not been involved in a cover up of abuse. That line in the Ombudsman's report, Maria Cahill says, supports her position that she is telling the truth. And as she sees it, the information casts doubts on Sinn Féin's consistent denials that they shielded a man accused of child sex abuse. They weren't completely open with the Irish public. They allowed a child abuser or a suspected child abuser to remain within. Sinn Féin came out fighting on the issue and they withheld information from the general public. As part of tonight's programme, Spotlight again asked Sinn Féin if Martin Morris was a party member. We also asked Sinn Féin if he was suspended from the party in 2000. We were waiting to hear back from the party when its president made this statement in Dublin earlier today. The issue around Martin Morris, I, I, have, I have asked and I'm advised there's no evidence or no record of him being a member of Sinn Féin. He was, of course, a former prisoner. He was a person who was very active on the ground. So I can't discount that he may have been a member. Our, our record keeping was not as it is now 20 years ago. Um, and there's no record of any suspension of him. As regards uh, your other question around intelligence and intelligence source, of course I'm not in a position to answer that. I'm not a spook, I'm not a spy. I'm not a police officer, I'm the leader of a political party and I have a responsibility, of course, to ensure that our processes and procedures are as they, as they must be. That's my responsibility, I will carry that responsibility, but I'm not going to answer for policing failures, which bear in mind is what the report was all about. Maria Cahill told Spotlight that today's remarks by Mary Lou MacDonald were cynically timed ahead of tonight's programme. I'm mindful that being articulate does not make it any easier to talk about difficult times in your life. Do you want to talk about what for you was your lowest point, both in a physical and mental health sense, since the original Spotlight programme was aired? There were a number of things which were just completely gobsmacking to me, but 
anybody from the outside in who isn't involved in politics, who simply would be looking at an abuse victim speaking, would find um, absolutely disgusting. And to be quite honest, um, the easy thing for me to do would have been to shut up and go away, but I wouldn't have been able to live with myself after it. Um, you know, when I was pleading with Sinn Féin, right back at the start when I, I remember getting in the meet the Taoiseach and coming out and saying to them, all you have to do is say that this happened. The man who led the Republican movement and Sinn Féin party for decades is someone who Maria Cahill knew well on account of her family connections. Her granduncle Joe Cahill was a long-time ally of Gerry Adams. Of course, the person in this photograph needs no introduction. No, it's um, Gerry Adams. He was um, a family friend of my grandfather and grandmother's, so you would have seen him about um, in and out of the house and, and things. There was a family connection with Jerry for years. In 2014, she told Spotlight her account of a series of meetings she had from 2000 with Jerry Adams about her allegations of abuse. Part of that conversation um, surrounded, you know, the usual, you need to look after yourself. I love you. We love you. Um, you know you can come to me at any time and I'll um, help you out. And I looked out the window at the traffic going past behind him and a tourist bus had pulled up. I always remember it because it was really surreal. There were people out taking photographs of the office that the two of us were sitting in. And at that point then, yes, it did kind of hit me that I was sitting with the person who was the head, the public figure um, of the Republican movement. Jerry Adams has repeatedly disputed Maria Cahill's account of her meetings with him. Two days after the Spotlight programme, he spoke to RTE Radio 1. In relation to what she says about the IRA inquiry or kangaroo court, call it what you want, you say that she didn't discuss that with you. Do you find her comments or her statements about that credible? Could that have happened, to the best of your knowledge? Well, it's been dealt with by the court, you know, and... and uh... Well, is that the way the IRA did business at the time? Well, I can't comment on that. What I do know is that it shouldn't have, <laughs> uh, if, if, that's what, uh, if that's what transpired. But, but really, this was brought she, into she the said court. It, she said it did. Why would she lie about something like that? Well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not casting any aspersions on what she is saying about that. All I'm saying is that this was brought before the courts. It's clear that Jerry Adams disputes what my version of events are. Um, and that's Jerry Adams' prerogative. But Jerry knows the truth and he knows that I know the truth. And if he had any decency about him, he would have told the truth in relation to this matter a long time ago. Instead, what he, he chose to do was to try and save his political skin and that of the Sinn Féin party. Jerry Adams has always maintained that he has told the truth in relation to the case. Three days after his RTE radio interview in which he said he could not comment on how the IRA handled allegations of sex abuse, Gerry Adams acknowledged in this personal blog post that the IRA did take action in response to allegations of abuse. He wrote, despite the high standards and decency of the vast majority of IRA volunteers, IRA personnel were singularly ill-equipped to deal with these matters. This included very sensitive areas such as responding to demands to take action against rapists and child abusers. The IRA on occasion shot alleged sex offenders or expelled them. As well as Gerry Adams, the new Sinn Féin party president Mary Lou Macdonald has consistently said there was no Sinn Féin cover-up. Sinn Féin has not engaged in any cover-up of abuse at any level of this party. This accusation is a vile slur on the thousands of decent, upstanding Republican people right across this island. There is no cover-up, I've said this a hundred thousand times, by Sinn Féin or anybody else on any of these issues. She has stated that Sinn Féin is withholding information and cooperation with the police. That is absolutely untrue. Those yeah. allegations but, but why are Maria absolutely Cahill, why would untrue. Why would make up these stories? Listen, I don't know, and neither do you. And you're asking me, do I believe Maria? Do you believe Maria? Who believes Maria? At the end of the day, I'm not sure that that's terribly helpful.
all of those statements cast um, doubts over my credibility to say that, oh, we believe that she was abused, but see everything else that she's saying, you know, there, there's something dodgy about that. Actually, there wasn't. And both the Keir Starmer report and the Ombudsman report are both independent, you know, um, pieces of evidence that actually add weight to what happened to me and what I was saying happened to me. Can you explain why, as you see it, Jerry Adams' words have caused you so much hurt, given that he's not the man that you made allegations of abuse about? I don't like it when um, people have access to information, probably more so than what I did at the time, and had a responsibility to do the right thing and then don't do it. And Jerry Adams was acutely aware of the hurt and distress that I was going through as a young woman when I spoke to him. Um, and he will also know that my account is correct. Maria Cahill was briefly a member of the dissident group Republican Network for Unity, which she says she regrets. In recent years, she was a Labour Party senator in the Republic and is now a councillor for the SDLP. Although she has never sought to hide this information, her political affiliations have led to accusations that she has an agenda against Sinn Féin. Do you have a vendetta against Sinn Féin? No, and you know, I've been asked this question on a number of occasions in relation to, you know, are you trying to attack Sinn Féin or do you have a political agenda against them? That's victim blaming, Jennifer. With the assertion that I'm somehow not supposed to criticise the Sinn Féin party, who did nothing with a child abuser for three years, just in case someone um, accuses you then of having a political ad agenda, is absolutely disgusting. In the last few days, Mary Lou MacDonald has said she's sorry Sinn Féin did not have the proper mandatory reporting procedures in place in the case of Maria Cahill. Tonight, Sinn Féin issued a statement to Spotlight. Unusually, it was issued through a solicitor. It said it completely refuted any allegation of a cover-up and said it would take all steps necessary to protect the party's reputation in the event of it being attacked. The statement concluded, we would like again to reiterate Mary Lou MacDonald's unreserved apology to Maria Cahill. But as Maria Cahill sees it, what are they actually sorry for?